Welcome to the Revelation Companion Podcast. Listen in as we dive deeper into the book of Revelation through special episodes and sermon recaps. Let's join the conversation now. Hey, welcome back to the Revelation Companion Podcast. We are here doing episode two. Ryan, you look good today. You look healthy. You look rejuvenated. But you're two episodes in, two sermons in on this Revelation series. How's the inner brains of Pastor Ryan doing? Not inner brain. Inner brain. Not your outer brain, (laughs) as some would think. (laughs) I'm doing well. I feel pretty good. Uh, I've been I've been uh, fasting quite a bit. Okay, that's been helpful. New spiritual discipline. Yeah, just you know, just enjoying it. So I feel good. I feel like. We are embarking on a a long journey. I feel like we're a slew of hobbits leaving the Shire. Yeah. Heading to Mordor. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I don't know who Samwise. I don't know who is uh, Frodo. I don't know who is Gandalf, but we're on a journey. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to be working through the meandering terrain of this book and all of its complexity. And, you know, some of the stuff I hear from people is like, this is dense um keep keep layering this in you know i'm not really worried too much about repetition in this study because i i recognize that an element of what we're undertaking some people feel like they're only gleaning 50 percent of what i'm saying but i think by the time we get a few months in people will will realize there's growth like one of the things that i I would just want to say just two people in general regarding our first episode now our second podcast episode and couple sermons in and an overview resource that we've produced for the church and stuff. Um, Don't be intimidated if you feel like you're only catching half of what's being said. Yeah. That's a sign you're growing. If, if, if there's no gap between what you're hearing and what you can take in, then you're not being challenged. So the goal here would be as we move through this over the next handful of months together, I hope our church feels more uh, uh, equipped in their understanding, more equipped in their uh, practical obedience to what this book is trying to challenge us into, especially as we move forward into the direct um, address from Jesus to the seven churches. I mean, buckle your seatbelt. I mean, yeah, I had a guy tell me Sunday after church, he said, you know, if I remember correctly, only five or two of the seven churches Jesus had no rebuke for. Five of the seven he had rebuke for. And in fact, the rebuke also came with consequence. That if you do not repent, I will remove your lampstand. Mm. And we'll talk about what that means when we get there. But I said, yeah, that's true. And he kind of laughed and goes, so does that mean like on average, like two out of seven people that go to church today, if Jesus were to show up, like five out of seven, he'd say, I have a hard word for you. Mm. And I was like, that makes you think, doesn't it? It does. It does. does. You know, one thing I'll say that I'm loving about the series so far is it is stimulating conversation. Yeah. And our group, your group, others, yep. I feel like I hear a lot of conversation. I mean, and that to me, that's encouraging. It's fun. It's it's good that people are getting involved in what is being communicated. Yeah. We're good conversation around the scripture, even parts that we're seeking clarity on. And, and if we can try to keep driving our applications, not to just what I think, but what it means for how I live. Yeah. We're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Beautiful. So uh, how's my inner brain? Uh, it's doing okay. I, I long for the sun. May it come back ever quick. Yeah. Those golf clubs are getting dusty. Do, the golf clubs are dusty. The bike is missing. The... <laughs> we won't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta fix all that as the spring arrives. Perfect. Well, let's hop in. We got okay. two sermons we're going to cover. Let's do You're it. You're going to um, go back through each one and kind of refresh your memory and then add some things. Yep. Yeah, so I just think, uh, just going back to the first sermon. So we kicked out the first sermon two weeks ago, Revelation 1, 1 through 3, just three verses. It starts off with the first phrasings, which is the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. That word apocalypse means unveiling or opening or revealing. And so the revealing of Jesus Christ. And we learn there in the first few verses that John is a human author. We learn that he's... Um, this this message is being given to him by a vision of Jesus and also also through mediation of angelic messengers. We know that it's it's from God to John and to the churches, which we learn as we keep reading. We also hear that it's prophecy. Um, so we know it's a letter. We know it's prophecy. And then I spent a lot of time in both our first episode podcast and the first sermon really trying to help people understand what apocalyptic literature is. And I just think that this, um, I can't say this too much because I want to make sure people don't 
mishear me or misunderstand me. And because it's foreign to most of us, it just needs to seep into our hearts. So apocalyptic literature, its purpose is to show you what's really going on behind what's presently happening Mm -hmm. and what's really going to happen in the future, even though we're in the present. So it's allowing the vantage point of heaven and the vantage point of the future to inform our current existence. Mm. So think of it this way. There's two vantage points that inform our present dimensional life. Heaven, the spiritual realm, and the future reality. So stuff that hasn't happened yet and stuff we can't see and sense with our five senses. Apocalyptic literature is trying to rejuvenate and prick and poke the right hemisphere of your brain to cue into that there is a reality that is happening that is operating on the plane of God's supernatural realm Mm. and to see the present in light of that. But then also to recognize that realm isn't time bound like ours. So see the present in light of the future. So the vantage point of heaven, supernaturalism, and the vantage point of the future, non-time bound, living outside of the fourth dimension, Mm -hmm. right? You're familiar with dimensions. Oh yeah. Yeah, height, depth, width, time, the fourth dimension. So that's what makes these books feel foreign to us. It's what makes them feel um, very left brain driven folks, which I'm one of those, logical, linear, rational, methodical, um, that this book is like, Hey, <laughs> like seven spirits and seven heads and dragons and stuff. You're just like, Whoa, yeah. like this feels like a, like a Lord of the Rings, yeah. you know? Uh, and so, so a lot of that, those, those concepts are important. So this is where we get into interpretive debates. Okay. Christians do. We hold strongly to the authority of scripture in our tradition, our church tradition, our local church, the authority of scripture, the inspiration of scripture is like doctrine number one. It is actually in the assemblies of God. Mm. The number one, number one doctrine is the authority and inspiration of all the scripture. It's Mm. number one. So I'm a Bible guy like that. Yeah. Where people get confused is they think that if you interpret the authoritative inspired scripture, in a way that's not post-enlightenment, rationalistic, left brain, Western linear, you somehow given up on the authority of scripture. That's a giant miss. Hmm. The Bible's always trying to convey literal truth because truth can never be anything but objective. But the the mode, the tool that it's going to use to show that truth wouldn't always have to be literal communication. The Bible uses poetry and it uses prophecy and it uses apocalypse to help do it. So again, I just want to help people understand because I had questions even this last week when I talked about the seven spirits around the throne. A very literal interpretive model would say that means there has to be seven different distinctive spiritual beings. Well, well, yeah, because if you read seven spirits with a literal left brain framework, what would you think? Seven entities. Yeah. But if you knew that the number seven is employed in all sorts of symbolic ways throughout the book, you might wonder, maybe that's actually an adjective of a spirit, not describing a plurality of spirits. Right. It doesn't mean that interpreting that non-literally has somehow sacrificed the integrity of truth. That's a Hmm. giant miss. And you'll see as you work through Revelation, you cannot do that. Hmm. You, you, and, and even people who claim to be literal, they're not. You cannot be. So it's not to say that somehow I'm in danger or we're in danger of somehow interpreting the resurrection of Jesus Christ as non-literal. The Bible doesn't present the story and the mere historical fact of Christ being bodily raised from the dead symbolically. There's nothing in the text to make you think that. But there certainly is when the number seven is attached to a spirit in light of how seven is used in a multiplicity of other places, embedded in an apocalyptic style Mm -hmm. writing. So again, I just want to help people. A word about literalism and and interpreting the Bible. The Bible absolutely is our authority, inspired, inerrant, the standard of truth for us on all things in life and practice. 
but the methods and vehicles of language that it employs don't always use literal language, though it is producing literal truth. Mm. So non-literal symbols can still be conveying literal truth. Substantive, objective truth. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Feeling good? I'm feeling great. I'm doing work here. I'm doing work to help the church um, interpret faithfully and interpret well as the author intended, right? Here's another little nugget for everybody. When you read your Bible, you can eisegete or exegete. Eisegete means to interpret by bringing your thoughts into the scripture. Mm -hmm. Exegete means interpret by drawing out the author's intent from the scripture. What was John trying to say when he said blank? Right. That's the truth we're after Mm. because that's the truth that's inspired. Yeah. Okay. So we have to be humble and not act like our interpretation is always right. But there are some that are better than others, some more historic than others, some with greater negative consequence and positive consequence than others. We hold our interpretations loosely, but we hold tightly to the inspiration, authority, and finality of the scripture as pointing to literal truth. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, so so a few things that in sermon one, I went to great lengths to have everyone understand this is about Jesus. Right. It's about Jesus before it's about the end times. It's a it does contain cataclysmic end times events, but those are all the footnotes to the prime header, which is Christ, the soon incoming King of Kings. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's about Him. It's for Him. It's it's all wrapped up in Him. He's the first, the last, the beginning, the end the Alpha and the Omega. The other thing in chapter or ver, sermon one, sorry, the verse three, first three verses, that's a tongue, a mouthful, a tongue twister. Um, John tells us that this book is a blessing. It's a blessing to read it. It's a blessing to hear it. It's a blessing to obey it. And I really camped there in the first sermon for my application to say to people, do you believe that? And I just want to remind everyone that, do you believe that? Hmm. Even two weeks in, are you like, oh my goodness, Really? Even some people are like, oh man, I'll come back to true church after they get through this six months. What does that attitude display? Hmm. There's three options we have when anyone of, of importance gives us a gift. We can reject it. We can ignore it. We can distort it. Or of course, the right thing, receive it with joy. Um, but I think that's what the church has done historically, not necessarily intentionally, but with this great gift, this last book of the Bible, which is a great gift and hard to handle um, because of its complexity, because of its apocalyptic literature symbolism, because of its confrontational nature, because dude, it is, mm. we've ignored it. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to read Jesus's like address to the church when he basically says, Hey, get this right. Or I'm no longer going to let you bear my name. Mm. It's intense. Mm. So we can maybe dismiss it or ignore it or reject it. Say, I just won't, I won't, I won't let this inform my life. Um, the other mistake would be distort it, right? It's just to kind of turn it into like a, like we talked about, a puzzle to solve, some sort of map to figure out um, where we could try to be right over its predictions, but never be submitted to its priorities. Mm. That was good. For yeah. Us. Yeah. Say that one more time. We could be right trying to figure out its predictions, but never be submitted to its priorities. Mm. And that, that kind of leads me to the heartbeat of the first sermon. I want to just recapture here. The heartbeat I want people to catch is studying Revelation isn't about mapping it out. It's about living it out. Are there elements of it to faithfully interpret it? Yes, you'll answer some mapping questions. Yes. Yeah, sure. I'm not like trying to vilify anyone that's like, well, I'm curious. I want to, I want to. Take a stab at trying to understand how the future might unfold. I get that. I'm not trying to patronize anyone or, um, you know, put water on your fire. I'm just saying to you, it's very easy to turn this book into a map project instead of a life project. Hmm. And I and I really want to steer us towards let's learn how to live this out, not just map this out. Hmm. Um, so I think that was really sermon one. A lot was said in sermon one that we covered in the first episode. So yeah, that was three verses real quick. The second sermon was the next five verses where we really dove into John, who's the human author and how he found himself on the island of Patmos in prison, what occasion the churches were facing historically, 
culturally. We talked about the power and dominance and uh, uh, wealth of the Roman Empire, um, how the emperor cult, the worship of Domitian was rolling out across the empire, really tempting the church to compromise their fidelity to Christ, their singular allegiance to Christ. And it's in this context, this um, the, this letter and all of its subsequent visions are written to and for um, the churches. So the thing about your second sermon that's funny is when you start getting into some of the cultural climate of their day, it's kind of like when someone asks you a question like, hey, asking this on behalf of a friend and like you can see like right through it, you're like, you're definitely asking for yourself. <laughs> like, like the cultural climate of that day, like, oh my gosh, it feels like you're reading. It's like, similar to, it, because what they were dealing with then that's different even from two, two decades prior, they weren't being killed so much for their faith. That had happened a couple of decades earlier under Nero. I think it was Vespian who was after him. If I 30 years prior. Yeah. Yeah. 20 to 30. Yep. Yep. And in this time that had kind of settled down. And what you have here is more of a, the church was, was being tempted to accommodate the religious priorities and values of Rome and think that would be okay. Mm. Did the persecution actually subside or did the church become less vocal in its announcement? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not super like brushed up on all that history. I'd have to look a little more closely. I think you could safely say some version of both because that would seem that would seem obvious. I just know from the reading that I'd done and preparing for that message and that, that context and, and stuff, there was less overt, violent persecution. There's some historical tellings of Christians being martyred, but it's much, it's much narrower mm. in its scope. It was also largely located to Rome. Hmm. You got to remember we're not in Rome. Yeah. It's the Roman empire, but we're east of Rome across the sea over in Turkey uh, or Asia, what, what they would call it, Asia minor. And so, you know, they're in a different location than the, the epicenter of the empire, which would be Rome. And, um, yeah, so I, I think that you could safely assume some combination of both. Just as the, the, the tide comes in and comes out, there wasn't as much vitriolic violence and persecution of Christians in the way that led to a lot of death. But there was a different kind of persecution. And that's what I think we face in, in the West. We have so many freedoms and we're grateful for, for them. We're not being persecuted in the West, hmm. but we are being tempted to either give up our distinctively Christian beliefs to fit into the culture or to suffer the um, marginalization of our non-compliance. Hmm. And, and that is happening. You see that in our own country, even to, you know, the frustration of many. But you see, if you hold certain views, they're not welcome in the public square. And I think that's what's going on in this context. The church is dealing with the fact that their primary responsibility to worship Jesus alone as Lord is, is putting them at odds with a prevailing cultural comfortability, which is pinch the incense and worship Caesar as one of the many gods you worship. Hmm. No big deal. And Jesus was saying, nah, that's not how I want you to, to live. And they were saying, yeah, but if we do that, we'll face consequences. And he was saying, endure, mm. overcome, embrace those consequences because you need to see what's really true about the world right now. Mm -hmm. I'm actually the ruler of rulers, not Domitian. Mm. And there is a day coming where every eye will see me and every knee will bow to me and anyone who opposes me will lose. Mm. So this explains why, and I went into this in the sermon after we learned John and he introduces... Of course, the Father, who was and is and is to come, and then the Spirit, the seven spirits around the throne, and then uh, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. And there's seven things said about Jesus there. Speaking of numerology, uh, he's the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings, the freer of sinners, the one who's coming on the clouds, the Alpha and the Omega and the Almighty. And um, those are all wonderfully important, dripping, packed with truth descriptors of the character of Christ which preach a sermon all on their own. I mean, you, seriously, of those seven, you could, I wouldn't do this, we'd be in this book forever, but you could preach a sermon on Jesus as the faithful witness. What does that mean? Hmm. He's the witness. To what? To who? How? How did he do it? Well, 
We, we, we pretty much studied the whole book two years ago. John, interesting. <laughs> John is the book that shows that more than any other gospel, right? Mm -hmm. That's the gospel that records Jesus saying things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm. I only say what the Father says. I only do what I see the Father doing. I only, like my, John 4, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. He says that to his disciples after he had the interaction with the woman at the Samaritan well. And they had a debate on who, who uh, on where they should worship. Man, that has so many implications when you look at Revelation. Here they are now, way further, further well, they're, they're from, from, from Israel. They'd be northwest. So they're in a whole different area, and they're worshiping Jesus. Yeah, worship of, the, worship of God wasn't going to be held to the confines of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is having this conversation with a Samaritan woman in John 4. She's like, well, us Samaritans, we worship on this mountain. And you Jews, you worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, a time is coming when my followers will worship neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. For those who worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. I mean, there's so much packed <laughs> there. I didn't intend to talk about it. I'm just saying, you could have a whole sermon on the faithful witness that Christ is to the truth as a concept, which really he is the embodiment of as a person, mm. and to the Father as the one who sent him, and how the truth, uh, the, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit also testifies to Christ, and Christ to the Father. I mean, it's dripping with like triune theology. It's dripping. It's just crazy. So that's faithful witness. Second descriptor, firstborn of the dead. Mm. That's the theology of the resurrection. It's the resurrection of Christ. It's the resurrection of the church, mm -hmm. which 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about, um, which we'll get into that when we talk about the rapture later on in our, in our, in our uh, series here. So, man, that's just wonderful. Ruler of kings. He's the ruler of kings. And this one's really important for them because here's what they feel and what they see. Domitian is the, the ruler of kings. Yeah. And Jesus is like, or John is saying about Jesus. No, 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 no. Jesus is the ruler of kings, right? So this collision, there's this definite uh, collision. I, sorry, I actually want to go back to point two. Okay. That, so on Sunday, you had talked about, on your point, the firstborn of the dead, is you'd given the example of the oldest son, the firstborn, the right to inherit all of which was his father's. Go a little bit further on that, because that's that is interesting to me. Like, what is its implications there with Jesus as it relates to to the end, but also in Revelation. I just think you have to recognize the the clever wordplay that's employed in Scripture. the The whole firstborn concept is a theme from the beginning of the Bible all the way through. Mm -hmm. Firstborn son was a, a, a you know prime inheritor of their father's estate, oftentimes a double portion compared to anyone else. And so, what does it mean that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead? Hmm. Paul says it's the first fruits, meaning he is the first forerunner of what it looks like for humanity to experience glorification. That's the word in the Bible, a new resurrected body to be glorified. And what's amazing about that is the reality of the resurrected Christ in his glorified bodily state isn't just for him. By implication, if he's the firstborn, it implies there'll be others. There'll be more in the family. Hmm. So we also are going to be the secondborns wow. of the dead. Revelation hits this man in chapter 20, where it talks about the first resurrection. First Thessalonians 4 hits this when it talks about the resurrection of the dead in Christ. They will rise first. Hmm. So there's a there's a resurrection of the body of which we will join, and in that sense, we'll be joined to the new race that is Christ, his glorified, heavenly, mm. resurrected body. Mm. So this, this concept, firstborn of the dead, is referring to a historical fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. Okay, that, that, that's top level. Layer down. Firstborn of the dead. He's the first human to die and then be raised in a glorified sense to where he'll never die again. Yeah. And then beyond that, he's the firstborn implication of a new family of which will become the secondborns. In that sense, it's where scripture refers to Christ as our elder brother. Mm. 
And it's like, he went first, we go next. And one day when he returns, we'll all get our born from the dead bodies, yeah. which will be glorified. And then, of course, that concept firstborn, a layer further down from that, is just the indication of that, 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 that first son and the promise he holds and how that makes way for the rest of his family. Mm. Um, Jesus is that. He is that for us. So it's just these descriptors are just pregnant. Yeah. With 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 uh, truth, mm. the language is so profound and um, powerful. And again, one of the things. Ready? Let's let's bring that to the ground. Yep. Let's go. What's that for? It's to fuel your worship. Mm. That's to expand your right brain in confidence and in awe of just how awesome Jesus is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you need that when you're tempted to question that. When the emperor says. I'm going to take your business away. Mm. I'm going to put you in prison. Um, I'm going to pull you away from the people you love. You need to remember the awe, the awesomeness of Christ. And that's what John is establishing at the Mm -hmm. beginning of this book. Mm. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) So ruler of kings, huge deal. I already kind of talked about that. Freer of sinners. That's just so good. I mean, I just love that John is hitting these things. He's, if you think about it, he's talking about the truth of Christ, the promise of what Christ achieved for us in his resurrection, which has implications for us, the authority of Christ, the love of Christ, the one who offered his very blood as a a proof that he loves us. He's talking about in the, the next one, the imminent coming of Christ on the clouds, that it will be a showstopper, as I said. Every <laughs> eye will see. You, you have a question here, Sean. Why don't, you, why don't you bring that question to me on the fifth point of Jesus, where I talked about him coming with the clouds. And the text, I think, says, even those who pierced him will wail on account of his coming. Yeah, so immediately my mind is thinking, those who pierced him. So those who pierced him were, I mean, they're dead. They've been dead for a long time. Very likely, yeah. Very likely. Who... Who is he referring to? Mm-hmm. Who are those who pierced him? Does that mean that the dead sinners who have already died will be risen again and, and see Christ come on the gods? No. No. What does it mean? Yeah, and that's again something important to talk about, like language, when, when he's saying those who pierced him is referring to there were those as him a matter of historical fact who were set against Jesus. Okay? So that would have been like the Sanhedrin. That would have been, to some degree, the Roman enterprise and empire, Pilate. They oversaw and cheered and called for the crucifixion of the Son of God. Mm-hmm. Crucify him. Crucify him. Those are those who pierced him. In an interesting twist of thinking here, uh, Paul helps us understand we're all guilty of that. Right. But, but again, to, to, from a historical perspective, there are those who said, No, I don't believe you're the Son of God. I do not accept the blasphemy. These are those who pierced him. Upon his coming, everybody who finds themselves aligned to the camp of the piercing of Christ, in other words, they're set against the reality of who Christ really is, they will wail. Mm. So let me get, I'll just try to use an example of how I would interpret that section. Let's say someone today who's very, very outspoken, God hating, thinks that Jesus is an entire myth and that religion, particularly Christianity, is a scab on history and it's a scourge of people jesus is going to show up at some point in some way where the people who think that are going to have to see the reality of who he actually is and how they missed it they will wail Hmm. wow yep they will mourn Hmm. you spent your whole life convinced that the very thing you never wanted to be true was actually more true than you thought. And he shows up in yeah. a show-stopping way. Yeah. You will wail. It's so, a warning. It's a warning. So in this section, the word pierce, it means and implies multiple things. It is used symbolically or metaphorically mm-hmm. of those who didn't physically pierce Jesus. Because I, as I assume it, as he was crucified, there's one person who actually pierced him with a spear. A Roman, a Roman guard. But there are those who, in, in essence, also pierce Jesus mm-hmm. through their vote to have him killed. Mm-hmm. And there are those who now, who we, at one time or another, 
partook in pierced him again. Mm -hmm. And there are those who are piercing yeah, him. I would suggest John is using a historical event where Christ was pierced and he's locating the kind of person who identifies with the spirit that animated that action. Mm. That's what's going on. That's how I would interpret it. Yeah. And I think you have to do that with lots of things. Cause you can't, you, cause your other option back to this like wooden literal approach is to right. say, Oh, the people that the guard that actually shoved a spear through Christ's side when he was on the cross who that happened in AD 30 ish. We're now at AD 90, 95, somewhere in that range. We're 65 years later. Is he alive? Maybe. He maybe was a 20 year old guard. Now he's 85. Cause John was alive then. Right. It's possible. And that's actually what most scholars will say that John, the apostles in his mid eighties in, in writing, he's in his, huh. he's in his mid eighties. Yeah. That's this a, is, this is an older age for that time. Wasn't it? Mid eighties. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the average lifespan was, but he's in his mid eighties. That'd be the claim you'd have to recognize hmm. to, to have this dating. So because of that, I guess, I guess you could say even the one guard who pierced Jesus is going to be like, Oh no, but we know that doesn't work. Here's why we know that doesn't work. Jesus didn't come back right. <laughs> in that guy's lifetime. Yeah. We're 2,000 years down the line. So how could the Spirit of God who empowered and inspired John to pen this letter of Scripture have meant? Yeah, You'd have to say what you said. When that happens, the dead evil are going to be raised right. to see and behold uh, the coming of Christ. But the Revelation answers that question. In Revelation 20, I don't want to steal our thunder, right. but we're well, months, away. <laughs> months away. The righteous Years. dead are only raised first. The wicked dead are not raised mm. until the very end of the millennial reign. That's my view. Mm. Even if you don't have that view, you're not a premillennial and you're an all-millennial, you'd say they're raised at the end of the church age. But still, we're not even at the end of the church age. So mm. I don't think you can say that. So, so what are you left with to have a faithful interpretation of those who pierced him when they see him on account of his coming? They will wail. It's those who were animated by the same spirit that was present when those who pierced Christ because they wouldn't accept who he claimed to be. You will wail when he comes because mm. because time is up. When he comes, when it's the showstopper moment, time's up. Mm. He's coming in judgment. Yeah. That's, that's the implication. Deep breath. Deep breath. Mm. Okay. So he's also the Alpha and the Omega. So he's coming with the clouds. He's the Alpha and the Omega. We talked about that yesterday. Uh, he's the beginning and the end, uh, the first and the last. That's not used in the section we read, but it's used in other parts. Um, and it's just a beautiful thing. The alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Mm -hmm. Omega is the last letter. And the way I think to think about that, again, back to this interpretation of imagery, this is God speaking, by the way. The Lord says this about himself. The Lord mm. God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He's not saying, I am literally the letter A to translate it to English. Or, yeah, it's just, it's just not, it's not, it's using metaphor to describe something literally true. Mm. Which is, if you were to put together a sequence of significance, I am more significant than the start or the finish of that sequence. Mm -hmm. Even the entire letter of your language. Mm -hmm. I am all that. Mm. And then if you add the other language, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, you start to see just the claim that God is making about his sovereign providential power. Mm. It's like, I'm the beginning of the universe. I am the end of the universe. I am the beginning of everything and the end of everything. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's just nothing that can't exist, that doesn't exist because I said it exists. Yeah. And there's nothing that will happen mm -hmm. that doesn't happen because I'm allowing it to happen and I'm leading it to its decisive end. Mm -hmm. And I am the destiny and the point of the universe. What's interesting to use the word um, beginning and end, their language, the language there, uh, I think this is in Greek, is arche. And that means archetype or the like the source and template and then telos, which means purpose. So I am the source, the template of everything. And I am the purpose and destiny of everything. Everything finds its fulfillment in me. This is why Paul can say this stuff in his letters. That's very lofty. Christ fills all in all. 
It's just like, whoa, what? It's just, it's a giant lordship claim. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just like everyone's like searching underneath the next black hole, beyond the next galaxy, underneath the next set of physics laws, subatomic particles and principles. We're trying to, like in our modern scientific pursuits, we're like, what's underneath the atomic level? <laughs> what's underneath the quarks level? What's underneath the quantum physics level? What's, we're trying to get to the bottom, the most fundamental substrat of existence. And what Jesus is saying is, once you get to the bottom of that, you're going to run into me. Hmm. <laughs> and then it's also kind of like whatever lofty level of emotional ecstasy or joy or whatever you like once you try to ex like i am that mm -hmm. i am the top of it the bottom of it the left the right the beginning the end the first the last the alpha the omega the whole enchilada baby it's about me mm -hmm. that's what that's what god's saying mm. and man that's like mm -hmm. that's that's a big deal that that kind of encapsulates how big of a miss it is then to have had breath and to have lived life and to have missed God. Mm. What's that sermon? It's in Acts, right? I think the Apostle Paul at Mars Hill preaches a sermon. Isn't it Acts 17? My memories. And he says, he says this, um, in him we live and we move and we have our being. Huh. That, that's an application of this point. Everything you do. You're sleeping, you're waking, you're dreaming, you're talking, you're playing, you're recreating, you're you're loving, you're serving, you're worshiping. It's all, it's it's all happening on the landscape of my sustaining power. Hmm. This is just a total like dominance claim, is what oh, it yeah. is. And I just want people to miss that because that also has um, a purpose. Why would John be writing this way, describing Christ, describing God, Father, Son, and Spirit? Especially we see a vision of Jesus. We'll see it next week in a very particular way, the Son of Man. But why would he be using these kinds of phrasings? There's a purpose. Hmm. He's trying to lift the eyes of people who are living in times that don't seem to match the claims hmm. of the kingdom come. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's saying to them, hey, I need you to see Jesus for who he actually is. Hmm. Not for some version you'd settle for, not for some version the culture would reshape him into, not to some version Domitian would like to relegate him to, not some version that you'd feel comfortable lording yourself over, not some version where you'd put cross your fingers behind your back and say, he'll understand. Mm. He, he's, he's revealing the, the lordship, the glory, the magnificence, the authority of Christ. And this is to serve as an encouragement to the church as a motivation for their faithfulness under pressure. Mm. That's what's going on. Hmm. So <clears throat> what are your questions? Well, I want to, I want to get into in our notes here. We have something about Zechariah four. Oh yeah. And, and I want to touch on that. And I even, I, I think what was fun is well, as we were sitting here, I just did a quick little, little search and even um, Zechariah 12 uh, subtitle that section is the piercing of the Messiah. It just got my, my wheels turning on, on what is here in revelation that is, is backed. Oh, big time. Take it away. <laughs> yeah. I'll try. I hate that. Cause I feel like I talk too much on this podcast. No, you, you here's you, the deal. Revelation references old Testament imagery, verses and concepts. Some scholars say up to 700 times. Now, here's P Scholar's frustration with John. His citing and his um, usage of Old Testament concepts aren't as precise sometimes as we would want. Mm. He's pulling stuff, but he's also seeing stuff. Yeah. What are you supposed to do if you're having a vision of the heavenly realm and the temple, which Hebrews tells us the earthly temple is a physical copy of a spiritual reality? Mm -hmm. What are you supposed to do when you're seeing that and trying to put words together of what you saw. Mm -hmm. You would pull upon the lexicon, the vocabularic structure of what you have deeply embedded in your heart. What's deeply embedded in John the Apostle's heart? The Old Testament. Yes. That's his vocab bank. It is his vocab bank. Yeah. It's Zechariah. It's Ezekiel. It's Isaiah. It's Daniel. It's it's Jeremiah. It's, it's the minor prophets, the major prophets. So as he's seeing divine things, cataclysmic things, apocalyptic things, the vocabularic 
bank. I like that. He pulls from, it's, it's what he would have deep within him. Right. So when he says, and before the seven spirits before the throne, you need to recognize that in the Holy of Holies, in the, the temple on earth, which started as a tabernacle God chose, told Moses and Israel to build, ended up Solomon building a brick and mortar house for the Lord, the first temple. It was then destroyed and it was rebuilt by Nehemiah and Ezra in the story of Israel moving forward. Jesus ministered in second temple Judaism. Okay. Yep. Then the temple was finally destroyed again in AD 70. Rome did it. Jesus prophesied about it. So in that temple, we, this, there was something called the menorah, which is a candlestick. But it has, you've maybe seen it, because like Jewish celebrations of Hanukkah and other way will we'll show these emblems, these images. It's a candlestick, but there's there's seven flames on it. Yeah. And they'd be situated in the holy place and they had function and use. And you can see all that. Go read your Old Testament, read Exodus, read Numbers, read all these instructions you have, Deuteronomy, about building the tabernacle and all the pieces God wanted there. Well, what are those pieces doing? Those are those are physical things. But Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews tells us, those are physical copies of spiritual realities. Hmm. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. So John is getting a vision of what? The spiritual realities. And so what language is he using to describe them? The language he'd know. Yeah. So when he refers to the one who was, who is, who is to come, and the seven spirits before the throne, and Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, ruler of kings, the freer of sinners, the one who comes on the clouds, the Alpha and the Omega, with all might and power, it makes sense to me that what he's communicating is the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. Mm. So yeah, you could say in, in that fifth verse, I think it was the fifth verse, was that correct? Yep. The seven spirits before the throne. Some say, well... No, I think that might be seven actual spirits. My only thing with that it would be to say, okay, what, like, what, what? Like, tell me. And it's not that it's wrong. Like, let's make a real clear note. Yeah. Someone might say, well, that's what I think it is. Okay. Not wrong. Doesn't change the meaning of the text. Doesn't change the meaning of Revelation. It's just someone saying there's seven spirits around a throne. And I guess those are seven spirits. But maybe they're mm -hmm. seven angels that are thinking about the seven churches. Uh, who knows? I just tend to think you could understand seven as a number that 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 re that refers to often symbolically manifold fullness. Mm -hmm. Why seven churches? Because they were sufficient to be a representation of what all the churches needed to hear. Mm. But Actually, seven were chosen. On that point, though, I think what mm. you need to share. You told me this offline. They were seven churches that served as almost like a distribution hub. Yeah, I, that is helpful to know that. Yeah, in the natural, they were all along a really common trade route and travel route. So they would become very logical distribution centers for this letter and this communication. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think it's helpful that there's the natural level, but then there's also the supernatural, that w what's on the other side of it, that we would later come to see that each one of these churches is also a representation of yep. modern day things. Yep. That And this is where also, by the way, we talked about this last podcast. The, histo ouch. the historicist reading of Revelation takes the seven churches and extrapolates them over the whole church age. Mm. I don't do that, but that it, that has been a way people have tried to look at this book and say, well, Ephesus, the first church, their love grew cold. And that's referring to the church, you know, in this particular century or that century. And it's because the reason for that, I think, is because the last church is Laodicea and they're the lukewarm church. And so it's always tempting for us to think that we're living in the last days, like our current generation, right. and we're the lukewarm, and it's easy to kind of glorify the church right before the church we are. Because the church before Laodicea was Philadelphia, and they got a good, a good word from, from Jesus. Hmm. So think about human nature. Last generation was good. Our generation is a mess. It's a hmm. common human challenge. Hmm. So every generation has tended to, if you want to try to historicize the seven churches and try to extrapolate it over the church age, there, there's, there's probably a reason why that's easy to do. Yeah. But it always tends to not work because the reformers did it and they were convinced that the Pope and the Catholic Church was that. Yeah. You know, and it's like, well, yeah, because what they were dealing with at that time was a lot of corruption and mistake and error in the Catholic Church, and it needed a reformation. Yeah, but by taking the historicist view, you tend to try to put then God kind of on this timeline that you're 
And, and it, then you kind of treat it like a map again. Yep. And that's another reason why I'm not a, I'm fan, I'm not a fan of it. It's not that it's wrong. It, we need to have a, an open hand with a lot of this. Right. But I'm just trying to be a guide for people through this. So, so yeah. So the Zechariah portion is just to refer to that section of scripture. Do you have Zechariah 4 up by chance? I do. I'm looking at it. Okay. It actually uses the, the word seven in a few different ways. So we have the seven lamps on it, the seven lips on the lamps. Uh, the seven, uh, these seven are the eyes of the Lord. Yep. Yep. Lots of language of seven here. Exactly. And so <laughs> it would make sense that we would look at that and go, who is embodying that role in the triune Godhood? The Holy Spirit. Right. The one who sees and the one who's bringing this truth to us, lighting the way. Mm. So again, an interpretive decision has to be made there on what the seven spirits are. I favor the decision that it's referring to the Holy Spirit. Did that answer your question? Oh, it did. Yeah. Okay. Love it. Good. What else? Man, we, I mean, you ended with the primary thrust of revelation is to see Jesus for who he really is. And a, kind of an ancillary piece to that for me is to also see the present moment for what it really is. Mm -hmm. And and with that, it just makes me go, wow, how much of our life in, you know, we don't want to over-spiritualize the things of like, all right, Lord, like, what do you want me to eat for dinner? Mm -hmm. But like, but, but where is God's hand at work I mean, everywhere mm -hmm. that I don't have eyes to see? Yes. And that's what this is just time. expanding our horizons yeah. and our minds. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like as we go through life here in 2024, who knows what this year will hold? We have a big election in our country. We have, you know, uh, questions about economy and potential worries about recession. And we've got, you know, an emerging generation trying to find their way and, and, and find the good life as you and I've talked about before. Yeah. And I, so I guess the question we should ask as Christians today here in Spokane is this, Lord, what am I living through right now that I need to remember these two things? Who you really are in all your rule, your wonder, your power, your love, your authority, what you're presently doing and how even if what I'm presently facing is hard, it's not always going to be this way. So what's really happening and what's really coming because of who Jesus really is is mm. that's the grid those are the i wish i had my glasses like taking my, I wish or my, <laughs> my futuristic ones that's the lenses right we're like all right this is going on in my marriage right now i just got this doctor's report i just got um you know my kids experiencing this at school and i'm trying to see that doctor's report and see that interaction with my friend and see this season of my life in my work and in my community and in my nation Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus is ruler of rulers. Jesus is the freer of sinners. Jesus is the faithful witness. Okay, got it. That's true right now, even if it doesn't feel like it. And it's going to increasingly be true. And, and one day I won't even have to put the glasses on because mic drop. Mm. He'll, be, he'll show up showstopper style mm. and inaugurate things to come. I can live in light of that. Mm. I can hold on today because of what's coming and because of the lens God is giving me to see through by his spirit mm. to see Christ. That, that's the application. And it's kind of weird because in John's writing, it's preceding the words Jesus has for each of the churches. Mm. It's a setup, which I think is very interesting. He's wanting to set the table for the authority, majesty, and glory of Christ and then what he's going to do is he's going to hand the microphone to Christ. Mm. And Jesus is going to go, oh, Ephesus, we'll start with you. <laughs> We're for real. And he'll say, you've done a lot of wonderful things. You've aligned yourself to me in so many wonderful ways, but I have this against you. Mm. You've left your first love. Mm. Go back and do what you did at first. Repent. Realize how far you've fallen. If you don't, I'll take your lampstand. Hmm. If you do, I'll give you the right to eat with me, the tree of life. It, it, you will overcome. So like he who has ears, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. So I, the, the, the particular instructions are coming, but John is starting with setting the stage for the glory of Christ. By the way, this is what I hope our worship service at True Hope Church looks like on Sundays. Mm -hmm. Why do we start with art and right brain singing and melody and music and and worship of God. Why do we do that? 
Well, cause we want to be a modern day concert. <laughs> Sorry about the spit. No, that's not it. We want to set Christ in the proper place so that when his words start to hit our minds and our hearts, we're eager to obey them. Hmm. Yeah. That's why. That's good. And then where there's con- where, where, not, where there's conviction, not condemnation, we then come to the table. Mm-hmm. Communion. And we say, but for your body, broken, and but for your blood, shed. I, I would have no chance to be remade into this new kind of human you are making this new kingdom of priests to be. Mm-hmm. So take this clay, Lord. Mm-hmm. Take it one step further. Heal what's broken, lead what's missing, move me further into the new humanity you're making. Mm. That's that's why we worship. Mm-hmm. And that's just one day, the Lord's Day, we gather and practice that communally, but then we live into that every day of the week. So anyway, that was kind of a, just a, a tangent. Well, I want to add something to that. It's kind of a funny topic to address, but it's it's that of in-person worship. And I just want to say this, that, I mean, even this Sunday... Um, I love coming to church on Sundays. It is such a gift and it's such a delight to be with other saints. But this even Sunday, like as you are, you're really expanding our vocabulary of what we think of Christ. And so it's like, nonetheless, if someone gets through all of Revelation, all they got was more adjectives and and beautiful ways to think of their Savior. Win. That's a win. (laughs) Yep. But as you're doing that and as you're, you know, this this language creates a culture and this culture then creates this movement or as Jesus would call it, the way. Yeah. Like you feel a sense of no matter what comes, I have this group of people. Yep. And and so I don't know, like I don't worship online, like I, I don't attend online and you can get, I think it's great. I'm so glad we have this form of technology. But I'll just say, there is a difference from when Sean's listening and singing along to the worship initiative in his car Versus when he's standing next to his brothers and sisters, Mm -hmm. praising the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so that is just one of the delights of, I think, the in-person gathering Mm -hmm. that I just trumpet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, online is a great tool. It's a poor substitute. Mm. It's an excellent supplement. It's a terrible substitute. Yeah. Yeah, I I just feel that as, I mean, even the fact that God described himself as Alpha and Omega, it's interesting we have such a loving god that the way that he describes himself is actually in love because the way he describes himself is something that is ironically comprehensible to us Mm -hmm. because we think a through z right and the fact that he even made it that simple and i know that's not all but that's that's the foretaste of who he is it's comprehensible comprehensible to our mind and we're like wow like when you introduce yourself to someone, do you introduce yourself in a way that displays love? That's so hard to do. And that's, this is what's so important about Jesus. Jesus is the comprehension of God. God is spirit. We are flesh. Hmm. Jesus is flesh. Hmm. Jesus is God. <laughs> Jesus is the definition and word, the logos of the Father. He is God comprehended on human terms. More so, he is God enclosed in human flesh. He's the message and the messenger of God. Hmm. This, this, is why, this, is, this is why this book screams Jesus, and it needs to do that for us. And that's so encouraging. Jesus is God made intelligible, hmm. yet still beyond our intelligence. <laughs> but intelligible, like, hey, I've come. See me, touch me, talk to me, Mm -hmm. walk with me. And knowing that he did and that he's doing it again. One thing that's beautiful about Christianity is it's just thoroughly interested in the physical. Hmm. The One of the early church heresies that the church had to combat against was Gnosticism. And Gnosticism was this gnarly cultic way of thinking. And it was essentially about, it was centered around this word gnosis, which means special knowledge. And there began to be a group of people who seeped into the early church who started to teach things like there's a special knowledge access to Jesus that we have. 
And this became known as the Gnostics. John, by the way, who wrote the Gospel of John and also 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the letters to the church, and also, I think, Revelation. One of his key assignments was to refute Gnosticism. Huh. It's why in the letters John wrote his epistles, 1st John, he says, anyone who says Christ did not come in the flesh is accursed and anathema. Because there started to be this lie that Jesus wasn't really fully human. He was kind of a mystical spirit figure. Huh. And that's what makes him super special. And there are few of us who have access to that gnosis, that spiritual knowledge, where the story of Jesus is quite the contrary. It's, he's very physical. He's, he's embodied. He's like, I'm here. He does miracles with fish and loaves. The central miracle of his ministry is the resurrection of his own body. His promise is that he'll give us resurrected bodies. Mm. God is spirit, but he is so in love with his created world. He became a part of his created world in order to redeem, glorify, and save the created world. So one of the mistakes that comes to Christians when they read Revelation, they don't realize it, but they sometimes read it with an overly Gnostic tendency. Huh. Which is to, 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 to be in love with mystery, in love with secret knowledge, secret codes, uh, a way to figure it out that no one else has been able to figure it out. And to miss the, the fact that what Revelation actually tells us, albeit using symbolic imagery modes, but telling us a very important anchored literal truth, God cares so much about this earth, he's going to come and, and reign on it and renew it. In flesh, hmm. in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's going to raise us in flesh with new bodies to reign with him. Hmm. Man. And he's going to make a new heavens and new earth in the end. But I, I love the fact that, and this is my particular theological view. I hold it very loosely. You're totally welcome to be a true church and have a different one. Because I'm a premillennial. I think Christ rules and reigns on the earth with the church for that thousand year period. And... Um, I think that just bolsters God's commitment to his original creation project. Mm. He's just not okay with scrapping it. Mm. He's like, no, 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 no. The snake ain't going to win. The dragon's not going to win. Sin's not going to win. Those who pierced the very flesh of God are not going to win. This earth's going to get renewed. Mm. And it will serve its purpose for which I originally intended. And so... Jesus is the language of God. Hmm. He is the comprehension of God. He is the embodiment of God in flesh. He is the letter of God, the communication of God, the logos of God, and he is embodied. So hmm. watch out for Gnosticism. Hmm. It's a sneaky little heresy. Hmm. And it kind of permeates in many forms. It causes us to dismiss the physical, the embodied. It's just about the knowledge. It's, that's how you know Christianity works for you because it's just a theory in your head, not something you can actually do with your hands. It's not actually a relational life you can embody. It's just a thought proposition you can sign off on. Mm. Uh, and I'm the big, I'm a thought proposition guy. I love theory. I love intellect. I love thought. But thought, notice that. Because God could have just like bellowed from the heavens an equation about his plan. But, but what did he do? He actually was born of a virgin and put on flesh and grew up in time and space to show us who he really was. Hmm. And what he wanted for us and what he was going to accomplish on our behalf. So, sorry, you just triggered me. I and love it, doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Triggered's the wrong word. You you poked me and you that whole conversation around embodiment uh, is important. Yeah. it's We are people of a place. We are people with limits. We are people with a body. God has great purpose for these bodies. Mm. So along those lines of embodiment... How do we avoid just having the title of Christian? And this comes out of a quote that you said this Sunday, functional atheists with Christian titles. So there's, there's quote, embodiment happening in our country around the world that has the title, Christianity, church, whatever you want to call it. Um, explain the functional atheist. Like, what, is that, what does that mean? How do we avoid it? Well, this is in, uh, I think this is in John, right? I'm just 
John's all over the map today. Yeah, yeah. I think it's John 15 where he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Mm. Right? It's a prophecy in the Old Testament that John, um, might have been Jesus. He might be quoting Jesus there, if I remember right. Yeah. And it has to do with when the Jews are rejecting Jesus as their Messiah. And uh, I think what I mean when I say functional atheist is I mean there's a way for us to be Christian in title, Christian in brand, Christian in talk. But if you were to examine our lives, you would you would be you would say there's not quite enough evidence to convict you that you're actually an embodied Christian. Mm. So the way your marriage looks, the way you parent, the way you spend your money, the way you live your free time, the the way you talk in conversation at work, the things you dream about, the things you look forward to, there's not a lot of evidence there that indicates you are the people of Jesus. Huh. That is the temptation the church has always faced. And they faced it at the end of the first century. Christian in title, but in practice, just thoroughly Roman, worshiping Domitian like everybody else. Hmm. Yeah. So could we be Christian in title, but just thoroughly Americans, worshiping our money, worshiping our comfort, worshiping our consumeristic patterns, worshiping our chance to go on our next vacation, worshiping our hobbies, worshiping and idolizing our families and all the things that we want to get out of this life. Because the truth is we tend to live like life is really just the 70 years we get here. That's all we're living for. Hmm. And we have very little view of eternity. That's what I mean by functional atheist. Hmm. Very convicting for me. Very convicting, I hope, for all of us that that's exactly what the church was tempted with 1900 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, and so we're actually going to talk about that. I mean, that, that's we're going to talk about that more on this podcast, but additionally, even later this year, we're going to read a book called Non-Anxious Presence that's mm-hmm. all about the strongholds in our world. And strongholds yep. are organizations that carry anxiety, and we, we run to them when we get when we get stressed out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and many of these things that are waging against our hearts and our wallets and our minds and et cetera are, are strongholds. And, and so, I mean, politics and everything that is in that gamut is a, is a stronghold. And so... Um, it's all interconnected mm-hmm. and that's what's crazy about going through the book of revelation is it, it kind of, it kind of doesn't let you leave anything out. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm feeling that just two weeks in, you know, knowing where we're going and trying to get my heart and brain prepared to serve the church through this. I'm just like, this is revelation is a, uh, it's a workout yeah. of mind and soul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 gonna be a fun. Six That's months. the answer to the original question I asked was how you're doing, like how you doing on the inner minds. It's it's a inner mind workout. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you're burning your mental calories. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if only that would translate to my physical dude, stature. You got like a six pack in there, dude. <laughs> it's like in my mind, I shredded. am <laughs> the Jason Statham my wife always wished I was. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, um, the last thing we got here, anything you want to say about the cycle that you introduced? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I just, I like graphics. I like visual aids. <laughs> I hope they help the church. I just want you to see that every church that's ever lived, 1st century, 3rd century, 9th century, 15th century, 18th century, 21st century, we always live in a present age. That age is shaped by ideologies. It's um, always in conflict um, uh, with the spirit of Christ because the spirit of the age wars against the spirit of Christ. The flesh is set against the spirit. The apostle Paul teaches us this in Galatians 5 and 6. So there's always a present age. as a spirit of the age, and it's always uniquely something. And it's also cyclical. And um, what we need to see the church as is an alternative community of hope that is a foretaste of heaven to come. The church is an alternative community of hope that is a foretaste of heaven to come. In that way, the church is the embodiment of the book of Revelation. We're trying to be the embodied picture of what life could look like because we know what's really going on isn't all that's going on. And all that's happening right now isn't the final announcement on Mm -hmm. life. So we're living as the alternate counter community That is a foretaste of heaven. We're a foretaste, the future in the present, the heavenly on earth. Jesus' prayer to his disciples. Teach us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on 
earth as it is in heaven. Hello. Mm -hmm. The way he taught us to pray, the way he wants us to live. We are the alternative community of hope that is a foretaste of heaven to come. Mm. So the future breaking into the present in imperfect ways, but as a promise that it's coming. So, so to, to flesh that out, I use three words to talk about the three movements the church must give herself to cyclically while we wait for Christ's feet to return and finish the job. What's the first movement? Be a refuge. The church is the community of refuge, but the refuge that's actually offered to people is firstly the gospel. It's Christ. It's come out from the world, give up on the idea you can rule and run your own life and still have it work out for you. Enter into this other domain where Christ is Lord and your brothers and sisters all say the same. This is the church as a place of refuge, of forgiveness, of healing, of safety, um, of mercy. So that's the first job the church has. The second job the church has is to move those people who've experienced refuge in Christ into reformation with Christ. So mm. this is a reforming of our way. You use that word, the way. Reforming of our values, our beliefs, our behaviors, our attitudes. Taking what we are, what we have, what we've practiced and saying, oh, wait, that's not what Jesus is saying. Mm -hmm. That's not what he's calling us to. That's not who we're becoming. So we shed the old, we put on the new in this reformative process. But then it doesn't stop there. It's not just a refuge out of the world and a reforming alternatively, differently than the world. It's ascending back into the world. Not for the purpose that we're the saviors of the world, but we are witnesses to the one who's the savior of the world. And this, in this way, we bring renewal mm. in every era, in every age. We are that alternative community of hope that's a foretaste of heaven where you go, man, there's, there's a glimmer of good. There's things happening there that if the whole world could be that way, that would be amazing. Mm. And we in that way are a prophetic announcement. One day it will be. Mm. And until then, we're not going to do nothing we're going to do something and we're going to love and we're going to serve and we're going to give and we're going to care and we're going to, we're going to try to do what we can imperfectly. Yes. But perfect savior, imperfect church. Um, so that cycle refuge, reformation, renewal is how we're called to interact with the present age. Hmm. And so sometimes we want to capitulate to the present age. That's what they were tempted to do. Just to go, well, we won't be a refuge and be called out of the world. We'll just become just like the world. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is you feel comfortable, but there's nothing to reform because you look just like your neighbors. And then if you look just like your neighbors and it's not going well, what hope do you have to offer them? There's no renewal for them. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to say because you're in no way living differently because you have not separated yourself from the spirit of the age. Yeah. So it's refuge, reformation, renewal. You could honestly say that the church goes through these big cycles historically. Yeah. And we've had big movements in times of reformation in the church and renewal in the church and a refuge, like a revival of salvation mm -hmm. in the church. And so God is faithful to keep that going in his church while he waits for the nations to be wrapped up exactly mm -hmm. as he sees fit. And, and there's mm -hmm. some mystery to that. And the scriptures speak of that, which we'll see in, Gen or in Revelation. Um, but um, yeah, I, I just wanted to end with a cycle. And again, all I'm trying to do there, you know, if I was using descriptors of Jesus to be a vocabulary that would enhance your worship, yeah. I'm trying to use descriptions and pictures of the church that will enhance your discipleship. Mm. So if, if character descriptors of Jesus enhance your worship, I want to use language and pictures for the church to enhance your participation and your discipleship in the movement that Jesus said, I will build this mm. and the gates of hell will not prevail. So if there's one thing, no matter how it changes, no matter what it looks like, Jesus said won't fail, it's the church. Mm. Not because of its pastors, because of its king, because mm. of its main pastor, Jesus. I mean, think about it. Governments fail. Nations fail. Businesses fail. Institutions fail. Cultural ideologies come and go. What has lasted for 2,000 years and counting? Hmm. His church. That's right. Hmm. Why is that? Well, because he's... He's the ruler of everything, and he says he's building it. Yeah. And there's nothing that's going to stop it. Yeah. So that's that's encouraging. Man, so good. Well, it feels like a pretty good spot to end, don't you think? It's awesome. Awesome. All right, well, this is an end to episode two, the Revelation Companion podcast, Until He Comes. It's going to be a showstopper. <laughs>